Good afternoon, colleagues from in Africa and the UK and across the world. I think our number of participants are starting to stabilize now. So I think it's a good time to, to start today's webinar. Um, a special word of welcome to the presenter today, Dr. Rachel James, from the University of Oxford. She's also currently a guest lecturer at the University of Cape Town. And of course, a member of two of the future Climate for Africa projects. Unvula and Impala. Now today's webinar is about an extremely challenging topic, namely how we can improve climate models and the simulations of specifically African climate. Now those of us that, that are climate scientists working here in the continent are very much aware of course of the persistent biases that exist in many of the current coupled models. And I think many of us will agree that from assessment report four to assessment report five of the IPCC, there has not really been significant progress in the simulation of present day climate over Africa. So um, Rachel has some very interesting ideas on how we can change this situation. And um, we will introduce her very soon, but before that, let me just mention there will be some polls running during the course of her presentation. You can see one appearing on the screen right now. So if you can, while you are listening to the talk, please also participate in these polls. And Rachel, with that, over to you. And we are looking forward greatly to, to hear your talk. Thank you. Hello, hi, thank you so much, Francois. It's a real privilege to have you chairing this webinar. Um, I'm just sharing my screen now. Is that visible? Fantastic, great. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. As you all have gathered, this talk is gonna be focusing on climate model evaluation. And whew, that sounds a bit dry, huh? but um, I hope I'm going to convince you that this is ex interesting and it's also a really important part of our work to try to inform climate change adaptation in Africa. And climate model evaluation is an important part of the work that's happening in the Future Climate for Africa program. It's also a really big part of my job. As Francois mentioned, I'm a climate scientist working for Oxford University, but currently based at University of Cape Town. Um, and part of the model evaluation work that I'm doing is with this um, awesome group of scientists that um, you can see listed here. And we've been trying to reconsider how we can uh, better evaluate climate models over Africa um, in order to try to help improve them. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. Here's an overview. First, I'm gonna talk about um, the kind of big picture in terms of how model evaluation fits in to work around climate services in Africa. Then I'm gonna talk about our work in our project to reconsider how we evaluate climate models in order to inform model development. After that, I'll give some examples of the approaches that we've been using to process-based model evaluation. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about next steps and the concept of a model evaluation hub for Africa. First, I'll just say that everything I'm going to say is pretty much written in this paper, which has just been published in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. And this is open access, so you can read it using the link that's at the bottom of your screen now. OK, so the context. Uh, this work is emerging from the Future Climate for Africa program, which is funded um, by the UK Department for International Development and the Natural Environment Research Council. And the aim of that program is to improve the availability and the use of climate information on a five to 40 year timescale. So we want to support decision making, long term decision making. Um, and if decision makers want to prepare for changing risk, uh, they might need some information about what's going to happen in future. So how do we find out what might happen to climate in the next five to 40 years? Uh, well, in general, we use climate models. Um, and I wasn't sure how many of you would be familiar with, uh, with climate modeling. Um, so that was the, the idea of the poll there. Um, and uh, just in case anyone um, is less familiar, um, I want to kind of go back to basics because I think as soon as climate scientists start talking about 
climate models, it can seem a bit like alphabet soup. There's so many acronyms. Um, but I'm going to try to avoid those acronyms. Um, two that you might need to know are GCM and CMIP5. Because most of the work that we do to try to predict what might happen in the next five to 40 years uh, is based on global climate models or general circulation models. That's a GCM. We run those models into the future um, up to 2100 and beyond uh, to try to see what might happen to climate under different scenarios. So what would happen if uh, we continued burning loads of coal or what might happen if uh, we shift to a more renewable energy mix with a more sustainable future. And here we're not just running one model. There are lots of different climate models, more than 20 climate modeling centers around the world. Um, and luckily for us, they're organized by the coupled model intercomparison project. So, sorry, program, the coupled model intercomparison program. So that's CMEP. Um, and they get all of the different modeling centers to run their models with similar, very, very similar experiments. And then we can compare them. So we can look at a range of possible futures. Now, those are global models, but since they run across the whole globe, we can look at uh, their output over certain regions. So we can use them to look at how African climate might change. Uh, for example, in this plot, you're seeing uh, potential changes in precipitation. That's rainfall. OK, so that all seems well and good. We have all of these experiments and um, the models have shown remarkable progress in recent decades. There's a lot of data available and it's coming from huge teams of scientists that are working on these models and really large uh, computing experiments. Lots of computing time and effort is going into this. Um, so that's brilliant, right? However, we have a problem. African climate is very difficult for these models. And Francois already talked about that a bit. So one of the reasons for that is that a lot of African regions are governed by um, convective systems, which are at a smaller resolution than the models. Um, another issue is that uh, there's a really important role for uh, remote sea surface temperatures and modeling that ocean atmosphere interaction is really difficult. Also, none of the climate models that we're talking about has so far been developed in Africa. Most of the uh, modeling centers have uh, for a long time been based in more economically developed countries, which have a history of weather and climate science, which is focused more on their own local region. Um, so there has been less work to develop models in Africa. That is changing, which is really exciting. And Francois's group are developing the first African climate model. Um, so we need more work like that. We need more model development in Africa, but also in modeling centers around the world that is focused on Africa. We also need better confidence assessments because as climate scientists, we often get asked um, by decision makers, you know, can we trust this model? Should we use the output? And sometimes it's quite difficult for us to answer those questions. What we're trying to say to you today is that model evaluation has potential to deliver on both of those fronts to inform model development and also to uh, produce better assessments of confidence in the model output. So that's the kind of big picture. That's why we're talking about model evaluation today. Now I want to kind of zoom in on our program and um, tell you a bit about the work we've been doing in our team uh, to rethink model evaluation. I'm working on this program, which is called Impala, and that's led by the UK Met Office. And it's really a concerted effort to try to improve their model over Africa. So they've got scientists working on convection, working on teleconnections, working on land surface interactions. Um, and uh, this is really important for the Met Office, right? Because um, the, what happens over Africa will influence what happens over the rest of the globe. So if the model can reproduce Africa better, it's gonna be doing a better job globally as well. So there's all that model development work that's going on. And then there's also model evaluation. So this is just some of the team of researchers uh, that are working on model evaluation in the project. Um, I wanted to show you this kind of cheesy photo of us um, to highlight that this is not my work. This is a team of us working on this. And the only reason that I'm doing the webinar and that I led the paper is because the others are all really important and um, 
they've got so many other things that they're working on. But this is really a team effort. And what our team are trying to do is to evaluate the Met Office global model over Africa. So we're thinking, what's the best way of us doing that? Um, and the first step was to look at the systems that the Met Office already have to evaluate their model. So the Met Office, like many other modeling centers, have already got um, quite well established systems for evaluation and for validation. Uh, for their global climate model, the Met Office uses a system called AutoAssess or Maverick. And uh, they have a lot of software developed, which means that like every time the model is improved, updated, or parameterization has changed, um, pretty much at the touch of a button, they can run this code and it's going to output diagnostics for a lot of different processes like global circulation, like the radiation budget, like uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So you have um, many important tools to evaluate processes globally. Um, and also for some regions. So you can, you can see here that's mentioned the Asian monsoon and they, they've been for a while tracking the performance of the Asian monsoon. But for Africa, the kind of plots that are output from these automated evaluation systems are generally more simple. Um, and this is an example of the kind of information that we'd often have available uh, by default, which is the difference between the modeled precipitation and the precipitation from observations. This is really important. Uh, we can see here, for example, that uh, out over the Indian Ocean, the model is six millimeters per day wetter than the observations. So this is important because it tells us that there are problems. What it doesn't tell us is how to fix those problems um, and how much they matter. So for example, if we think about um, South Africa here, you have a bias of about three millimeters per day. So does that matter? Does that mean we shouldn't be using the model in that region or is it okay? So if we wanted to better inform model development and also confidence assessments, how should we be doing something differently from these basic bias plots? Well, rather than just quantifying biases, what we want to do is to understand them. So if there is a wet bias, why? Why is that occurring? What are the processes uh, that, that uh, contribute to rainfall generation in that region and how are they represented in the model? And once we start talking about these processes, it becomes clear that this is not really a validation exercise. It's evaluation to try to qualitatively understand the model better. Um, often the, I, the aim of validation is to really check, you know, is the model good enough? You might want to quantify in a single performance metric or a skill score, how good is your model to rank it against other models or to see how it compares to the previous version. And that doesn't really give us that much information about the regional circulation or how the model behaves or how to improve it. So this is why we're talking about diagnostics, which can be more flexible than a metric. Another good thing about focusing on processes is that it can help to tackle this problem of observational uncertainty. We know that um, in many African regions, there are problems with the data records. And you can see that here, there are big spatial gaps as well as temporal gaps. And in the in recent decades, there's been a big drop off in the amount of data that's been going into the gridded uh, data sets. By focusing on processes, we're not really just put, putting, resting everything on a quantitative comparison between these observations and the model. So if we want to improve our automated evaluation systems for model development, we need that evaluation to be process-based and region-specific. Luckily, there's already a lot of expertise in different African regions, um, which in some cases is already working towards evaluation of models and in other cases could be. So um, we know that there are groups like Francois' group who are doing really excellent work um, to understand processes and climate models over these regions. There are also a lot of experts, for example, in MET services who normally work on weather, um, but who really understand uh, which processes are important in that region um, and what drives the weather. And that expertise could be really useful if um, linked up with the modeling centers um, and with climate um, scientists who are looking at models. Um, and, and so what we're talking about here, it's not 
revolutionary. It's more about making that link and specifically feeding it back into model development. Happily, there's also a really nice opportunity at the moment to, to, to make that happen. So um, the, the World Climate Research Programme um, and the Climate Model Intercomparison Programme are making plans for routine evaluation of CMIP models. And this is written about in this recent paper by Veronica Ehring. And what they're trying to do is to use community-based assessment tools to run across CMIP. I already mentioned that some of the modeling centers have their own automated evaluation infrastructure, but this is not set up to run across all of the different CMIP models. So at the moment, whilst we have a load of data from each modeling center, it takes a lot of effort to analyze that and understand it. And the amount of data that are available is much greater than the scientific capacity to analyze it, especially in regions in Africa. So um, their plan is to automate that evaluation so that we can much more quickly understand the models. And there are already a lot of tools available globally, for example, from projects like ESM Valtool, which they can quickly include in this new um, routine evaluation infrastructure. However, unless something new happens, these tools might not tell us much about how the models represent Africa. They have kind of recognized this though, and in the paper they talk about um, getting expert groups to work on areas where there are gaps, and that could be around certain processes or it could be around certain regions. So they're kind of welcoming new communities to come forward and work with them to develop assessment tools. And this is really an opportunity to include something for Africa. And this is kind of what's motivating all of our work here, really. We're thinking, okay, if we're going to be uh, making the effort to develop these diagnostics, what should we be looking at? Which processes should we be evaluating and how? We've tried to summarize that in our paper, going through different regions, these four different African regions here, and also um, th thinking about pan-African diagnostics. And uh, a different expert has been working on each region and um, summarizing some of the really exciting work that's already going on to evaluate processes in each region, but also thinking about gaps and using one example diagnostic to demonstrate what we mean by a process-based approach. I want to show you two of those examples now. So the East Africa example is work by Joseph Mutemi, and I think Joseph is online. So Joseph, uh, thanks very much for letting me present this, and I hope I'm going to represent it well. What you can see here is a comparison between winds in reanalysis data and the Met Office model. And the, the 850 hectopascal winds, um, and the vectors show you the wind, and then the contours there show you the, the zonal wind speed. So orange areas are westerly winds and green areas are easterly winds. What you can see is that in the equatorial Indian Ocean, the winds are actually in the wrong direction in the model. So instead of being westerly, they are easterly. And th this is quite a basic analysis, but um, I think it's been really useful just by focusing on the um, season sorry, I should have said this is the um, East African short rain season, October, November, December. And just by focusing on that season, we found something which, is, um, which was not previously known um, or at least not previously highlighted about this model. And that, is, that can be really useful for model development. It's also the kind of thing that we might want to compare across different CMIP models. And Linda Hirons has actually done some work recently to look at um, the winds in the Indian Ocean across CMIP and found that many of them are quite similar to this Met Office model in showing easterly winds here. Let's move to West Africa. In West Africa and particularly in the Sahel, there's been quite a lot more research than for other African regions. And the Met Office has known for some time that uh, some versions of their model underestimate um, the West African monsoon. So we're just going to compare that between satellite data 
and the Met Office model and look at um, the precipitation, which you'll see here in the contours um, and how the latitude changes as we move through the rainfall season. In the satellite data, you see a distinct shift of the rainfall maximum moving onto the continent in mid-July. However, in the model, the rainfall maximum doesn't really move from the Guinea coast quite over the continent. So you can see that this version of the model is having this problem with not quite getting the monsoon rains. We want to understand that better. And so we're using this diagnostic, which shows us a cross section average between eight degrees um, west and eight degrees east. So what you see here is um, the latitude from south to north and then height on the y-axis. And we're comparing now the reanalysis data with the Met Office model here. The green lines show you the precipitation again, but um, as only averaged. And again, you can see that the peak precipitation in the reference data set is much further north than the peak precipitation in the model. The blue to red shading shows you the vertical velocity. In the reanalysis data, there is a large zone of ascent which matches with the peak precipitation. Whereas in the model, you see quite a different structure of vertical ascent. There is ascent here, but um, there's also some other peaks. Moving on to think about winds, the, sh the uh, dashed con contours show easterly winds, and we can see the African easterly jet here, which is further north in the reanalysis data than in the model. So this diagnostic is giving us quite a lot of information about the structure of the regional uh, meridional circulation and is a useful diagnostic which we can um, apply across models to track features of the monsoon. This isn't revolutionary work. It's um, drawing on previous work by Sharon Nicholson, by Linda Hirons, and also by Babatunde. Sorry, I should have mentioned all of this work is led by Babatunde Abiodun, the West Africa stuff. Um, and he had done some plots like this to look at other models, you know, more than five years ago. So we're not talking about revolutionary stuff here. Um, the point of the paper is more to highlight that if we use these kinds of diagnostics and if we can develop uh, perhaps five even diagnostics uh, for each um, region and apply those across models, we would have a lot more information about how the models behave. And so in order to achieve that, we've talked about this concept of a model evaluation hub. A hub could um, encourage collaboration amongst African climate scientists, amongst communities working on African climate, and also collaboration with model developers to collectively identify priorities for evaluation, to share insights from recent model evaluation research, and to of ultimately to develop diagnostics for the CMIT deck analysis toolkit that I've been talking about. And we think if we could do that, there would really be a legacy of improved understanding of climate models over Africa. We wrote this stuff in the paper, and since we did that, um, we've been getting a lot of questions about this. So what could a hub look like? Who would it involve? How would it work? Which institutions? And also, who is going to pay for it? Um, well, we, we don't want to be prescriptive about um, any of this stuff, really. Um, we're trying to, um, well, we're acutely aware, really, that this is, um, whilst it is from a collaboration across um, African countries and the UK, it is a UK-led project. And if this is um, going to work, it should be for Africa, and it also crucially would need buy-in from those experts across the continent. And so we are wanting to get um, feedback about this idea and to uh, see where people might want to take it uh, so that it could be a community initiative. And I should also highlight that our project is coming to an end soon. So this is why we're pushing now to try to see what we can do um, to, to make this happen before our funding runs out. Um, so we don't want to be too prescriptive about what it, what it, what it would work like, but um, 
we have now written a concept note which puts out one potential vision. We we're talking in this concept note about a people-centered hub. So this is not only about code, it's not, we're not just talking about a hub of um, tools. Uh, this is about people. And this could be an expert group, it could be a task force, um, it could be a panel. And there are examples to follow. So for example, um, there is the MGO task force, which is a group of people who have really done a great job to develop diagnostics for the Madden Julian oscillation. And that could be one way of doing this. Those, those experts, that group, they could consult a wider community of scientists through workshops or conferences and an online platform. And they could also encourage scientists to deposit their existing code into a Git repository so that uh, people can start sharing code and adapting it for new models. But ultimately, if this uh, code is going to be run across CMIP5, it would need to be really robust. And so then the expert group could develop a list of priority diagnostics and work with programmers um, to make those high enough quality that they can be included in the CMIP deck toolkit. And there's already some kind of precedent for doing this, um, or at least some plans. So as part of this CMIP deck stuff, um, the uh, working group on climate modeling and their metrics panel have been talking about potential um, governance structures, potential funding options to make that uh, collaboration between scientists and programmers happen. Um, and we could kind of be a good example for other regions or other um, interest groups to follow. If we can get, get those diagnostics into the CMIP deck toolkit, there could be also a longer term goal and you could have meetings to track progress at each CMIP phase. And hopefully once you have much more information about how the models represent Africa, uh, there could be more incentive to improve the models over Africa and, and more ability to. So we would hope that that would see more progress. Okay, so I'm just quickly gonna summarize. I've try to highlight that model evaluation has an important role to play in efforts to improve climate information for Africa. And whilst there are some really exciting efforts going on to try to understand models already, this evaluation isn't yet routine and it's not necessarily going to inform model development without further effort. So we need to be pushing for that routine evaluation and um, to make sure that it is process based, region specific and guided by local expertise. In our paper, we're just demonstrating some potential examples, and you can see more if you download that paper. Uh, but the hub uh, could embed many more Africa-focused diagnostics into the CMIP infrastructure and therefore promote model development with an African lens. Thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I'm really keen to get feedback, questions, um, and uh, well, if you want to be involved, then hopefully you have an opportunity to show that interest in a poll that's going to come up soon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rachel. This was a most exciting presentation as, as I thought it's going to be. And these are some really grand ideas you've just presented to all of us. Now, we have received a few questions. Um, I certainly also would like to reflect on some of the statements you've made, which I think are really de deserving further, of this, uh, it deserves further discussion, most, most certainly. But let me just first ask you a few technical questions uh, on behalf of our audience. Sure. Um, the first of these, has arrived from Faya Bouquet. Uh, I hope my pronunciation is probably not correct. Apologies, Faya. Um, this question, and I'm going to, to, to formulate all the questions quite concisely, colleagues, um, so that we can get through all of them. But the first question I can translate to the following. Um, to what extent, Rachel, will model evaluation be region dependent? So we know that on the African continent, there are so many diverse regions in terms of climate. You know, we, we stretch all the way from the tropics to the Mediterranean regions. 
Now, to what extent can we develop diagnostics that can be generally applied across the continent? Or do you think that we will really have to look at regional diagnostics, really region by region? Well, I think that um, region by region is going to be more informative. So in the paper, we have a team with experts from, in this case, from East Africa, from Southern Africa, West Africa, and Central Africa. And the kind of diagnostics that we developed and also the um, processes that we referred to in the paper are quite different. So in, you saw the two examples there in West Africa, focusing on the monsoon and in East Africa, we're focusing on the interactions with the, the Indian Ocean. There's also um, some work to look at the difference between wet and dry years. And there are lots of um, important uh, teleconnections from the sea surface temperatures there in the Indian Ocean. Um, and then in Southern Africa, as you've mentioned, you start to get interactions with the temperate climate and there we're focusing on tropical extra tropical cloud bands um, and then in central africa this is you know the core convective region in africa one of the um, three most important uh, centers of convection in the world and there you see other processes operating as well so um, so i think that in order to really understand those regions, um, the evaluation is going to be more helpful if it's region specific. What yeah. do you think, Francis? Yeah. No, I would, I would, I would tend to agree. Um, I would say absolutely. Um, the, these processes are, uh, processes are just so diverse across the continent that a regional focus will be needed. Um, and that, of course, comes back to needing a really big coordinated effort that involves, you know, uh, in the long run, African scientists that will always be working in their respective regions. And uh, that is, I think, how the Future Climate for Africa program can really also build a long-term legacy if, if we, as you have just, can, as you've just proposed, can have a long-term coordinated view of, of doing these evaluations. Now, um, let me also, while the questions are coming in, just point out to all the colleagues that we did also, of course, in recent years have had a very important initiative in Africa, namely the Coordinated Regional Downscaling Experiment, which is also a World Climate Research Program initiative. And this was indeed for the African continent, there was a specific CODEX program and it was very much focused on coordinating regional climate change projections for Africa. And within that program, which is coordinated for Africa by the University of Cape Town, there is also quite a focused and coordinated effort in model evaluation. So I think that that was a really important first step towards coordination. Now, Rachel, our next question is, is from uh, another colleague. Um, this comes from, let me just scroll up here. This is a question from um, Susan. Um, on, on my screen, I've, I can unfortunately not see the center anymore. The questions are now streaming in. But Susan is asking you who the owners are of these CMAP5 models that you are evaluating. So how easily do we get access for these coordinated evaluations? And then she's also suggesting and she's saying, can't what you are proposing here be funded by the CMAP5 model development groups? So, so let's see what you think about those ideas, Rachel. <laughs> um, so the CMAP5 data are publicly available. Um, they can be accessed um, online and used for educational and scientific research freely. You, all you have to do is sign up. Um, the only barrier then is having the, um, I guess, the capacity to download and analyze the data. There are also a number of portals that have been used to subset the data and make it a bit more easily accessible for those who are not climate scientists. So certainly those are, those are publicly available. Um, 
the second part of the question was whether modeling groups should fund the hub um i'm not sure i mean a lot of this stuff is um or at least the way that these model these model experiments are produced is kind of done on the goodwill of the modeling centers already so i think I don't know all of the details, but I think that the modeling centers um, kind of agree and volunteer to run these experiments so that their results can be compared. Um, so then I guess it's a question of how much resource is available and also who funds those modeling centers. Um, but I suppose it would be some, one way that we could, we could have a discussion with them about what they think about how, how we can best fund it. Yeah, Rachel, I would, I would once again agree with you. I think um, the main contribution from the international modeling groups is that they're making all these wonderful mm. data sets available for free download for climate scientists across the world. So yeah, it, is, it, it, it is quite amazing. And it's, it's a wonderful, I think, uh, achievement by the World Climate Research Program. And it's, of course, very closely linked these um, coupled model intercomparison project archives to the IPCC assessment reports. So I think um, you are quite correct. For us as African climate scientists and for all of those interested in African climate, it's all about um, having the capacity to download these very large data sets, if, especially if you are interested in analyzing the three dimensional atmospheric dynamics or ocean dynamics. The biggest challenge is perhaps to, to, get, uh, to get these data sets downloaded in a reasonably efficient way and to have efficient hard disk space. So there are some technical challenges, of course, in working with the data sets. Um, a, a related question that just came in is whether the Cordex project has ended. And there I can just perhaps quickly say that the Cordex project is still very much alive. Um, there's a Cordex archive where regional projections can be downloaded. It's very similar to the CMIP5 archive, which, which Rachel has been presenting about today. So I think Cordex is gradually heading into its second phase. And of course, the CMIP5 the CMIP process is gradually turning into the CMIP6 process that is now very much ongoing. Um, Rachel, now here's a, here's a really big question. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, we have a question from, from IGRI, and this is really centered to your talk. Why is the African climate system so, so challenging for climate models? You have alluded to this in your talk. Mm. Um, let me also point out again what I've mentioned at the beginning. We haven't really seen progress in present day climate simulations in these models going from the fourth to the fifth assessment report. But for many other continents in the world, there was very good progress. So why is this, why is this African climate system so challenging for the models? I think it's a, um, a combination of things. So it, in part, it's characteristics of, which are inherent to the climate system, which make it difficult to represent using these models, which because they're running for hundreds of years, at the moment, they're running at a reasonably coarse resolution. So we're thinking like a grid spacing of around 100 kilometers. Um, and that is very large compared to the scale of the convective systems, mesoscale convective systems, which are so important for rainfall generation in Africa. It's also large when you think about this, the, um, some of the topography that there needs to be represented. I noticed a comment in the chat coming up about topography, which plays a really important role in some African regions. Um, and it's a large resolution compared to some of the steep gradients that you get. If you think about the West Africa, you have a really steep gradient in temperature and pressure between the Sahel and the Sahara, and which is very dry, and then the wetter Guinea coast. Um, and then, like I was saying at the beginning, you have also um, uh, an important role for ocean atmosphere interaction, more so than for mid latitude regions. Um, and uh, important interactions with the land surface. We know that um, some African regions are real hotspots for this land surface interaction. Um, 
and that is again challenging to model the models are getting more um, complex all the time and are in some cases getting better um, at representing these kinds of processes but there are challenges there which are different from and in some cases uh, bigger than the challenge of modeling other regions but of course you also um, do have uh, it, it, in a lot of cases a less previous research about how the models represent African climates and less um, time and attention on trying to improve them. Does that help? Does that answer the question, Francis? What do you think? I certainly do, Rachel. Um, yeah, I think I think one of the points you've, you've you've mentioned very clearly just now and in the talk is about um, land atmosphere interactions in Africa. Mm -hmm. And of course, that, that links up very, very closely to the, to the very, very big challenge of simulating or representing convective rainfall in the models. Let me, let me also point out that, of course, uh, understanding the microphysics in African thunderstorms and how that may relate to the very, very unique land atmosphere interactions in Africa. I'm thinking specifically about biomass burning. So if you think about um, biomass burning in Southern Africa, Southern Africa being the largest source of biomass, biomass burning aerosols in the world. And just think about uh, North Africa with this. I'm further to the North in the Sahara. So they are quite fascinating processes working in Africa, specifically in the, in the field of, of micro cloud microphysics. And that is certainly a search for African climate modelers and, and international modelers working on this in this part of the world. So I think what you've alluded to is certainly one big part of the, of the answer. Um, let, me, let me test with you and our audience a semi-political statement that I think is the other part of this coin. And that is that I think the, the model development effort has always been disproportionately focused on northern hemisphere climate issues. So I think um, there has not ever really been in the historical past uh, a, a really focused effort on climate model development through an African lens, which is of course exactly the theme of the Future Climate for Africa research program. And it's a theme that is really important for many of us working on the continent. So I think by coordinating a much larger, simply by, by drawing the attention of more Northern, Northern Hemisphere climate model development groups to Africa, through this coordinated evaluation effort you are proposing, we can gradually change that situation around. And I think we will learn a great deal more about African processes and the biases in the models through such a coordinated effort. Um, perhaps a, a response from you, Rachel, before we move on to the next question. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I totally agree, Francois, and I think that, um, yeah, I did forget to mention aerosols, which of course is, um, I think, I'm not sure if the sound was completely clear for everybody. You were cu cutting a little bit in and out when, when I was, when I think when you're about to mention dust in the Sahara <laughs> and the importance of that. Um, and, and we're really only beginning to um, incorporate uh, some of those aerosols in the climate model. And they, they have such an important impact on climate as well. So that's another challenge as you're saying. Sure, Rachel. Um, let's, let's move through a few more questions. Um, the next question comes from Oforu Kimambu. And he is making the statement that we need a serious uh, model evaluation effort around the intertropical convergence zone in Africa. Mm. And also how that relates to um, specifically forcings and responses in the Indian and Atlantic Oceans. So um, your comments on that, please, Rachel. Yes, I think this is um, 
really important. And in the paper, we talked a bit about um, evaluating the ITCZ in the Pan-African section, because one of the things where we can really benefit, I think, from this kind of coordinated effort is in linking processes between regions. And the ITCZ is one kind of feature that, um, at which you know mi migrates north and south with the overhead sun and so has an impact on a lot of different regions um, and in the paper we, we just talked about using vertical velocity as a way of um, investigating that in the models um, but I think that um, I, I, at least I know of some really great work that's still ongoing for example, within the Future Climate for Africa program, which is looking at this um, in a couple of the different projects. And I, I imagine there may be other work in other projects that I'm not aware of. So part of the exciting thing I think about um, if we can make this hub happen is just to, for all of us in, in working on these um, issues in different places to kind of come together and talk about where we're at, how much we already know about this and what we can do to to push that forward and understand more. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I've, I've just received instructions, colleagues, um, from the organizers of this webinar, South South North, and many thanks to them for organizing, that we have to work towards the close of our webinar. And um, so this, we can only have one more question, of course, and there will be follow-ups in terms of all the unanswered questions. So this, this very, very last question, um, has been posed by Joseph Mutemi. I'll have to shorten it. He's making the statement, which I think is correct, that moist processes and moist convective processes are critical in our model improvement and evaluation effort. And then he also refers to the Impala project specifically. Um, Rachel, can you please just conclude by informing our audience on this very, very ambitious and impressive Impala high resolution model simulation for Africa. And, and with that, please, please close your presentation, Rachel. Great, thank you so much. And Joseph, um, Joseph is a co-author on the paper and a key, um, a key scientist in this team. So thanks Joseph for being there. I'm sorry that we didn't um, quite manage to make the connection so that you could um, also speak on here, but thanks for your questions. Um, so, so yeah, I didn't go into um, this new exciting CP for Africa simulation, which has been developed as part of Impala. I think there are other plans for communication and maybe even a webinar about that. Um, but one of, yeah, one of the other things that's being done within the Impala program is to run a regional climate model over the whole of Africa at uh, just over a four kilometer resolution. And um, this would be, this is a convective permitting simulation. So usually we have to represent convection with um, equations which are not always, um, representing the, the rainfall systems as well as we might like. So the models that we're talking about here often rain um, too early in the day and they have too much drizzle and not enough um, heavy rainfall. So if we can switch off the parameterization for convection at this high resolution, it could have a much more uh, reliable representation of the rainfall generation and this is a really exciting opportunity to test that in this in these new simulations that are coming out so it's definitely something um, for people to keep on top of what the new findings that are coming out from that because there are a lot and it's been really exciting. That is uh, very exciting indeed Rachel and uh, thank you very very much for sharing these ideas with us today. And I'm sure our audience can be in contact with you for further clarity. And I think, um, yes, colleagues, please. yeah, and, and colleagues, um, if you if you simply Google FCFA, you can also find a lot of information on the on the data sets being generated by the project, the research, and the great value this project these projects have for climate change adaptation on the continent. With that, we unfortunately have to close, colleagues, and uh, we bid you farewell until our next webinar. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Francois.